So now I want to introduce you to the concept of dot plots for visualizing sequence alignments. So a pretty common tool for helping visualize sequence alignments and in particular genome sequence alignments uh, is the dot plot. And so the, the idea of a dot plot is shown on the right where it's basically a, a heat map of um, where the rows are the different positions of sequence one and the columns represent the different positions of sequence two. And so the idea of a dot plot is that um, basically if you consider uh, the ith, the cell in this heat map at row i and column j, so that's what I'm calling sij here. Basically, there's only two possible values for sij. sij is either um, one, which happens if the uh, sh if a short sequence around position i in sequence one and uh, the short sequence around position J and sequence two have a high alignment score. So if they match pretty well, essentially, then the score in, or the heat map at that position IJ is one, otherwise it's zero. And so in the heat map on the right, basically blue means zero. So there's no strong similarity between most positions in sequence one and position two or and sequence two. Um, but it, basically where you see the white lines, that's where uh, you have high sequence similarity between position I and J in across sequences one and two. And so if you look at the if you look at the heat map on the right, what you'll see is you'll see kind of like two diagonal lines. And what those lines represent is basically that um, the start and the end of sequence one and two basically match pretty closely. Um, what you see though is you see kind of like a vertical gap uh, in the in the heat map and that corresponds to basically a deletion that tells you that essentially there's a deletion in sequence two relative to sequence one. Um, how you can kind of infer that is that if you look uh, at if you look across the different columns of this heat map, you'll see that for every column in this heat map which corresponds to a position in sequence two, there's a match there's a white, um, box in every column of this uh, heat map. And so what that tells you is that every position in sequence two has some matching position to sequence one, but the reverse is not true. If you look at all the rows across uh, this heat map, you'll see that in that kind of gap area that I've circled with a red uh, oval, there is basically a segment of uh, sequence one for which there's no matching position in sequence two. And so that again tells you that there's either an insertion in sequence one or deletion in sequence two. And so here's an example of a dot plot between two sequences that are identical, except for an insertion of three bases in the sequence represented by the columns. And so I've colored those three uh, bases in red just to make them easier to see. And so the idea is that when you want to draw a dot plot, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to consider every base in the first sequence, which is represented by a column, against every base in the other sequence, which in this case is represented by the rows. And so for each column and each row uh, between the two sequences, which is basically represented by a single box in this table, you want to decide whether or not the sequence centered around that column and that row is similar enough such that you want to put a dot there to indicate that you know the local similarity between the two sequences uh, at those positions is high. And so here for example I've drawn an arrow uh, to one row and an arrow to one column to represent the two bases that I'll consider uh, putting a dot there to indicate high sequence similarity. And so when you draw a dot plot you have to decide three different parameters. The first parameter is basically the window size, which says that, okay, you know, given that I'm looking at, for example, the, the column that's pointed to by the arrow, um, how big of a window around that column do I want to consider as my local sequence? And so here in this example, we'll select a window size of three, which means that when I'm looking at the column represented by the, uh, or that's being pointed to by the arrow, um, 
what I'm considering is my local sequence is basically that column, that T, as well as the one base to the left and to the right of that. So really I'm considering the uh, short sequence ATG represented by the first three columns. And similarly with a window size of three, uh, then I'm just uh, really looking at the first three rows of the second sequence. And so when I decide whether or not to draw a dot um, at that row and column indicated by the arrows, I'm really asking the question, is ATG similar to AGG? And so the first thing you need to do is, once you've defined your windows and defined the row and column that you're looking at, you want to basically just compute how similar are those two uh, short sequences. And so in this specific example, we'll just give a score of plus one if the bases match and uh, say negative one if they don't match. And so because ATG and ATG are identical, that means that their score is three. Um, and so finally, you have to also decide a threshold. And so the threshold basically just says if the score of the matching between these two short sequences is at least, you know, the threshold amount, then draw a dot there. And so if I set the threshold to be three, then these two windows actually match up and they pass the threshold because they're a perfect match. And so they get a score of three. And because three is at least as big as three, then I'm going to put a dot at the row and column pointed to by the two arrows. And so I can basically, basically you, you want to go through this thought process for every row against every column in this entire table. And so because in this kind of made up example, uh, sequence one matches sequence two exactly except for an insertion, basically what you'll see is you'll see more or less um, you know, two diagonals on this uh, on this dot plot. Um, but one of the most important features of this dot plot are that you'll notice that for the three bases that correspond to the insertion in sequence one, you'll notice that there's no dot in those corresponding columns. And that's because the insertion in sequence one uh, doesn't have any matching sequence in sequence two. So that's why you don't see any dots in those three columns. On the other hand, you'll notice if you look along the rows, almost every row uh, has a dot in it, with the exception of just a few rows uh, around the boundary of the insertion. But basically, uh, the point of this dot plot example is to show you that if you have two sequences where they only differ by an insertion, it's easy to see that from the dot plot because you'll see that there's, in this case, you'll see a whole bunch of columns missing a dot, but most of the rows have a dot. And so what that means is that there's some sequence, there's some part of sequence one that doesn't have any match to sequence two, but every part of sequence two has a match to sequence one. So that's how you can automatically tell that there's an insertion in sequence one. And so here's an example of a question that, you know, I want you to kind of, that I think you should take uh, a few minutes to answer before you um, move on to the next slide. So I think you know now is a good time to take a uh, take like a two minute break to essentially think about what this particular dot plot tells you, right? And so again, just to give you a hint, um, the diagonal lines on the first at the beginning and the end of sequence one and two basically tell you that the start and end of sequence one and two match pretty closely. Um, but I want you to think about what that, I want you to stop the video and think about what that uh, kind of off diagonal line that I've boxed in dash lines represents. So here I'm drawing another example dot plot, where in this case I'm showing what a dot plot would look like if there is a single duplication of it. So suppose we have two genome sequences, one corresponding to an ancestral genome. So that's the genome sequence of an organism that we uh, don't observe today. So like, for example, the human mouse ancestor. And suppose we're dot plotting that ancestral genome against a so-called extant genome. So that an extant genome is basically a genome of an organism that we do observe today. So say, for example, humans. And so suppose that in the extant genome, we observed a single duplication illustrated by the colored boxes on the rows of this diagram. And so what you notice here is that when there is a duplication in the, in this case, the extant genome, what you see in the dot plot is that 
every row of this dot plot, so that corresponds to every position of the extant genome, has only one dot in every row of the dot plot. And that's because there's an exact match to some position in the ancestral genome. But on the other hand, if you consider the columns of this dot plot, which correspond to positions of the ancestral genome, there's actually two dots in every column that was duplicated. And so the point here is that when there's a duplication event <clears throat> for the shorter sequence, you'll notice that there's kind of parallel lines in this diagram. And so that tells you where the location of the duplication event is. And so here's an actual alignment between the human and chimp genomes. So these are whole genome alignments between human and chimp. And so what those, uh, what the vertical lines uh, in this dot plot represent are the boundaries between the different chromosomes on the human genome and the row and the uh, horizontal lines uh, across the rows basically give you the boundaries of the chimp uh, chromosomes. And so what you can see is, again, as you'd expect, because human and chimps are relatively, the genomes are relatively similar, um, you see a lot of bands along the, uh, along the diagonal of this entire plot, which says that there's a lot of large scale matches between the human and chimp genomes, which is what you'd expect. Um, but what you also see is a bunch of off diagonal, uh, off diagonal lines. And so I've indicated here What's indicated here is basically an interpretation of what those bands tell you. And so I also, again, kind of want you to think about, you know, I want you to look at these bands and try to understand, okay, try to convince yourself why an inversion looks like the way it does or a relocation looks the way it does. Um, I've shown you here on the right uh, two additional heat maps, which kind of zoom in on the uh, dot plots for the Y chromosome specifically in chromosome 21. And this is just to illustrate again that for some chromosomes like chromosome 21, basically the plot looks more or less um, like the human and the chimp chromosome 21 matches pretty well. Whereas for some chromosomes like chromosome Y, you see a lot of um, kind of small to mid scale genome rearrangements uh, happening as evidenced by the off diagonal lines. And so again, just to summarize, um, you know, for the purposes of this class anyways, uh, what we do with these alignments is mainly we use alignments to map reads to genomes, to the genome. And so, for example, here's a plot showing you uh, reads from an RNA sequencing experiment that have been mapped to uh, known coding sequences on the genome. And so basically the point here is that uh, each of these short little lines corresponds to one read that you've sequenced. And so basically the, the goal of this visualization is to really just kind of see, okay, where do all my reads pile up? Essentially, where do I see a high concentration of reads mapping or aligning to a particular region in the genome? Because basically, basically the more reads that I see mapping to a given region, that means that for RNA sequencing experiments, um, that's more indication that gene is being expressed or that transcripts being expressed. Um, for other uh, experiments, like for epigenomic assays, um, those reads tell you where potential like enhancers or regulatory elements are. And so basically the where these reads pile up gives you some evidence of some kind of uh, maybe not perhaps function, but uh, there's at least some, for example, in this case, expression happening at that locus in the genome. And so alignment, sequence alignment uh, in terms of you know, the kinds of software that you use to align reads to the genome is, is a pretty mature, the software is pretty mature. Um, the two to three kind of main challenges that might be relevant even today is number one, uh, speed. And so obviously, uh, depending on how much sequencing data you're producing, um, a lot of these kind of alignments, especially when you talk about genome scale alignments, can't really be done on your computer, uh, not very easily anyways. And so, um, in practice, if you were to, you know, try to go home and, uh, you know, if you got really excited about doing genome alignments and went home and tried to align the human and chimp uh, genome, uh, you might not be able to do it on your laptop. Uh, you'd oftentimes have to use like a high performance computer, uh, to do this in practice. Um, and especially for people that do a lot of like metagenomic sequencing and things like this, um, speed starts to become a problem because, um, you can really generate really large scale 
uh, data sets, especially with a lot of those like portable sequencing machines that are available today. Um, another main challenge is that uh, really alignment, at least of reads to the genome, uh, which is the main application of alignments that we talk about in this class. Uh, one of the main problems you have are basically the question of, you know, are there really good reference genomes available? And so for organisms like humans or like, you know, Drosophila or C. elegans or yeast, um, there's a lot of good, relatively good reference genomes available. Um, but if you're studying things like, if you're doing things like metagenomics or mi the microbiome or things like this, um, there oftentimes is a lack of good reference genomes available. And so um, that's where a lot of problems with alignment happen. Um, and actually, in specifically in the RNA sequencing lecture, uh, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about problems related specifically to aligning short reads. And so again, the problem of having good reference genomes available becomes more and more important as you have short, you know, the shorter your reads are. Um, and more specifically, especially when it comes to RNA sequencing or HiC, which we'll explain later. Um, split reads become a problem. And so I mentioned earlier that uh, in the review lecture that all, obviously alternative splicing is <clears throat> a pretty prevalent uh, occurrence in like higher eukaryotes. And so the problem you have is that suppose that you have like a really highly alternatively spliced gene where you some of your exons that get spliced together are actually pretty far away on the chromosome. Um, but suppose you don't know what the structure of your genome is ahead of time. The problem you have is that if you're trying to, for example, detect alternative splicing, uh, altern alternative splicing with short reads is a huge problem because if you, you know, when you're trying to characterize alternative splicing with RNA sequencing, and you know, you basically want again, you want reads that map over junctions between exons because reads that span, uh, you know, single reads that span multiple exons tell you which exons get spliced together. Um, but if you are trying to, you know, if you have an, if you have a short read, say like 35 base pairs from Illumina sequencing, and that 35 base pairs spans like a junction between two exons that are like really far apart on the genome, then the real alignment that will tell you that that those two exons that are really far away in on the genome get spliced together, the real alignment there will have like you know, could have like tens of thousands of gaps corresponding to the sequence in between the two exons. And so you could imagine that under any like real scoring penalty uh, scheme, the score of the real alignment will be like really bad. And so in the RNA sequencing lecture, we'll talk about strategies for getting around that problem.